Think of an affordable mid-sized Qashqai class SUV and it's a reasonable bet that you won't be thinking about this one. Or maybe you should be. Sang Yong's Corando has always offered tough capability and value, the kind of thing active families might need. This smarter fourth generation version though continues that tradition while also adding quite a bit they might want to. A Corando you could aspire to? Well, if that's what's on offer here, then it would represent quite a transformation from this model line's utilitarian roots. The first generation version of 1983 was basically a Korean version of the crude old Jeep GJ7, while the curious looking Mark II model of 96 had more modern panel work, but wasn't much more sophisticated underneath. So Sang Yong took some time out, looked at what modern families wanted, and reimagined what this model line could be. The resulting third generation C200 series design launched in 2011 was a very different kind of Corando, complete with slick Italian Giugiaro styling. This was the first Sang Yong design to swap a heavy duty ladder frame chassis for more car-like monocoque underpinnings in pursuit of a sensible school run ride and more acceptable handling. All along with a high specification and pricing that made opposition models look needlessly expensive. It was a big step forward. By 2019, though, the market had moved on. Buyers wanted more responsive dynamics and higher levels of efficiency from SUVs of this kind, plus greater quality, more technology and higher levels of safety. Sang Yong's dilemma lay in how to provide all this while still creating a product that was tougher and better value than the competition. And what they've come up with is the C300 series Mark IV model we're going to test here. You'll have noticed that it's smarter to look at than a contender from an affordable brand might be expected to be. Sang Yong promises you'll be equally impressed by the quality of the redesigned cabin, which can now include the brand's Blaze cockpit digital screen technology and by the amount of camera-driven safety kit now included in the price. More of a surprise for loyal buyers might be the brand's decision to downsize this model's diesel engine. The previous lusty 2.2 litre unit that caravanners and towers like so much has been replaced by a smaller 1.6 that the company promises will still lug along a couple of tonnes and can be mated to the kind of optional four-wheel drive system that's often either missing or unaffordable in family SUVs of this kind. Plus, it's all matched with a strong value proposition, though one that's certainly more eye-catching when this car is ordered with its alternative 1.5 litre petrol engine. Whatever Corando you choose though, match it spec for spec against direct rivals and you'll be looking at a substantial saving. Interested yet? If so, stay with us as we check this car out. If the Corando is to go mainstream, it must have mainstream appeal. And you can see at a glance that evolution of this model line towards that end has continued here. That'll be evident the first time you drive this fourth generation Model 2, though something of the previous car's sturdy feel remains. Certainly enough to please its core market, who'll prefer the diesel version we're trying here over the more affordable 1.5 GDI turbo petrol variant. Historically, around a third of all Corando buyers have been serious towers, members of organisations like the Caravan Club, and you can certainly see why customers of that sort would be attracted to this car. Instead of the feeble 1.6 tonne towing capacity that's typical amongst affordable mid-sized SUVs at this price point, this Sang Yong charges less but gives you more in this diesel auto form, providing a much higher two tonne towing limit. Yes, it still does, even though the diesel in question is much smaller in this fourth generation model. A 134 horsepower 1.6 with 324 newton meters of pulling power replaces the previous 174 horsepower 2.2 with 400 newton meters of torque. It's a big change that would certainly have some effect if you were lugging something really heavy, but the key here is that unlike most of the competitors at its price point, the Corando will do it. As Sang Yong points out, even towers usually spend the vast majority of their driving time not towing, so it makes sense to get a car with an engine that's gutsy enough to be capable, but small enough to be efficient. Is that what we have here? Well, we reckon that after a test drive in one of these, many buyers in the company's core market are going to think so. 
But what about those crucial customers beyond the traditional ones, the target audience we mentioned at the beginning? Well, it depends who Sanyong has in mind. We don't see that much traffic for the brand amongst people currently buying Nissan Qashqai's and Seat Attica's. Those are slightly different kinds of SUV to this one because they don't really have to be in any way capable in terms of towing or off-roading. They're considerably lighter, more agile and rewarding to drive in a way that this more capable Corando still can't quite be. We think the brand's other SUV at this price point, the Tivoli XLV, is a better fit for that crowd. If though, like most potential buyers in this segment, you're not particularly interested in driving on your door handles, then you'll have slightly heavier, slightly less family hatch-like affordable mid-sized SUVs on your radar. Models, for instance, like Kia's Sportage and Hyundai's Tucson. If you've test-driven crossovers like these, then jump into this Sangyong, then you probably won't have any problem with the slightly light steering or the fact that the diesel variant's performance figures, 62 miles an hour from rest in 12 seconds en route to 112 miles an hour flat out, are a fraction behind the class standard. The alternative 163 horsepower 1.5 litre GTI turbo petrol model records the same sprint but can reach a top speed of up to 120 miles an hour. Actually, there are plenty of reasons why you might prefer the driving experience this Corando offers up. True, as others have pointed out, the ride quality over poor surfaces at low speeds can sometimes get slightly unsettled in a manner you wouldn't experience with obvious rivals. But that's only because Sangyong's goal here was to considerably improve body control through the bends. They've achieved it. Aided by its freshly stiffened chassis, this car now flows from corner to corner with real poise, making cross-country journeys far more enjoyable. That steering may be light, but it's also accurate, allowing you to place the car exactly where you want it. Another huge improvement over the previous model comes in terms of refinement, which in this diesel variant is in a different league from that served up by the previous 2.2 litre black pump fueled model. The grumbly vibrations of that old unit have been banished here, thanks not only to the change of power plant, but also to a whole host of engineering noise reduction measures. Underfloor damping, additional roof panelling, pillar cavities filled with sound absorbing foam, twin dynamic dampers in the rear propeller shaft, we could go on. The bottom line is that Sangyong has really gone the extra mile to transform this model's standards of refinement. It's paid off too. At idle, the brand claims this car is over 1.5 decibels quieter than a rival Kia Sportage, and that advantage continues once on the move. The only time you really hear the diesel engine to any real degree is under heavy throttle loads. On the highway, it settles down into a heavily muted thrum that makes long trips far more relaxing than they were in the old car. And of course, with the petrol engine, you'll find that it's quieter still. If you stick with the diesel, you'll find that it has to be mated to auto transmission in our market. With a manual, the towing capacity would drop to around the level of the petrol unit, which can tug only 1.5 tonnes. It's a six-speed self-shifter that Sangyong buys from specialists ASIN, and this time comes with proper steering wheel mounted paddles rather than the fiddly toggle switch that was offered next to the old model's auto shifter. Another change is the way that this transmission now offers you three selectable driving modes. Normal and Sport are self-explanatory. Plus, there's an extra winter setting that starts the Corando in second gear to avoid tyre slippage on icy roads. What about four-wheel drive? Well, diesel customers get the option not to have it, providing they're happy with mid-level trim. And with the 1.5-litre petrol version, you can only have front-wheel drive. In some ways, though, it seems a pity to get yourself a car with such a solid, capable feel, then give it only two driven wheels. If that's your perspective, then you'll want to find the extra for the all-wheel drive variant that we're trying here. Like most cars in this class, it uses a torque-on-demand 4x4 system, one of those setups that's constantly able to shunt torque around to the wheel that has the most grip so that power is always used efficiently. 
Unlike some of its rivals, this particular system also has a lock mode, selectable should you be on very loose or slippery surfaces or find yourself with this Sangyong somewhere you really shouldn't have ventured in the first place. Here, drive is allocated equally between front and rear wheels to give you the best possible chance of extricating yourself. Not that this should suggest this model to be a really serious off-road mud plugger. If you want that, then find the extra for the brand's larger Rexton model with its tough body-on-frame ladder, chassis construction and low-range gearbox. The Corando, like its direct predecessor and like all its competitors, uses a more car-like monocoque platform, though one mounted in such a way as to allow this car to be capable of piste as most owners will need it to be. Sangyong quotes an approach angle of 18 degrees and a departure angle of 24.5 degrees. These figures aren't quite as good as those of the previous model, but in compensation, the engineers have now added in the hill descent control system that the old car lacked, there to help your vehicle slither down steep slopes. And there's also a hill start assist system that'll aid you starting off up them. All well and good, but of more importance, of course, is the way this car can cope with the urban jungle. It's now certainly better equipped to do just that. Every variant in the range now bristling with the kind of camera-driven safety kit that earlier Corando owners could never have even imagined having. All versions of this car can now brake themselves to avoid an accident, steer themselves back into lane on the highway, read speed signs, dip their headlights at night, warn you if you're feeling drowsy and alert you if you're in a traffic jam and you haven't noticed that the car in front has moved off. This is, you see, as we've been saying, a different kind of Corando. And if you're a different kind of buyer in this segment, we think you might like it quite a lot. This is easily the best looking Sangyong model to date, which is important in a class where the majority of buyers cite style as the number one reason for purchase. Remove the bodywork here and most would guess at an established volume brand, which is exactly what the Korean maker was aiming at. The company is now very confident in its own design, so whereas original versions of the previous model were penned by Italian stylist Giugiaro, this fourth generation car is all the company's own work. As with other modern Sangyong designs, the key brand identifier is the so-called bird's wing themed styling of this front end, which sees a silver upper grille bar arching down beneath angular headlamps that feature LED multi-reflector beams on top models. Chiseled bonnet character lines, three horizontal chrome slats across the lower intake and vertically stacked LED front fog lamps complete the effect. Refreshingly, Sangyong sees no need for the kind of fake lower skid plate that would adorn many a less capable rival model. In profile, things are much as you would expect from a trendy SUV in this segment. Roof rails, black plastic clad wheel arches and so on. Though there's a bit of extra attitude here. Some of that comes courtesy of this forward slanting C-pillar and a pronounced crease that emphasises the rear haunches by curving over the back door handles. At which point a straight upwardly slanted swage line rises towards the front wheel arch. The wheels have gone up a size to suit the current zeitgeist. There are smarter 17 or 18 inch alloys on mainstream variants and some particularly attractive diamond cut 19 inch rims on this flagship ultimate version. Sangyongs works hard on the rear too, arguably too hard because there's certainly a lot going on here. A chrome bar flows above the prominent tailgate badge and curves under the LED lamp clusters in a style intended to reflect the frontal bird's wing theme. The lamps each incorporate three arrow-like reflectors, creating quite a distinct nighttime signature, while more reflectors sit further down, flanking a recessed number plate area sitting above a silvered skid plate panel. There's also a roof spoiler, a bee sting style aerial and boomerang shaped fillets of black trim to embellish the tops of the C pillars. Okay, let's take a look inside. In the past, this Korean brand has struggled to deliver the kind of interesting design, depth of quality and material richness that European buyers expect from the interior of a car in this class. This is much better. 
Someone at the brand's Pyong Tech R&D design studio must have a thing for glossy piano black plastic because there's acres of it around the front of the cabin. It's even on the gear stick. All of this creating the kind of trendy modern feel that the company hopes will appeal to this car's target market. On this top model, Infinity mood lighting is integrated into the shiny panels in a stylized form apparently inspired by the design of stringed instruments. It bathes the cabin in your choice of 34 different shades at night and makes you feel as if you're in some kind of fashionable cocktail bar. Continuing the sophisticated theme is the Blaze cockpit screen package that's offered at the top of the range and on selected lower spec models. This links an eight or nine inch center dash infotainment display with a fully customizable 10.25 inch digital instrument cluster. Yes, the kind of thing you'd get on an Audi. The virtual instruments you view through the smart three-spoke steering wheel work a bit like they do on an Ingolstadt Model 2. The mapping, for instance, can either sit between two screen dials or be expanded across the whole screen. The latter option here, accompanied by curious barrel-style speed and rev counter readouts. Alternatively, you can choose between two styles of digital speedo readout, each of which takes up the whole screen, or have the monitor show you trip computer, safety assist, or audio settings. The high definition LCD center dash screen has plenty of features too, though it only gets navigation in its larger nine inch size, the one limited to buyers of this top spec ultimate model. You do get a DAB tuner across the range though, which might sound obvious in this day and age, but was something you had to add in as a dealer fit extra on the old model. There's Bluetooth of course, plus providing you avoid base trim, there's Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring too. Top models incorporate a reversing camera and the screen can be segmented so you can, for instance, see mapping and audio readouts at the same time. Not all the little bits and pieces included here are that helpful. Is it really necessary to be able to choose between seven different profiles for the car's warning chimes? And when was the last time you used a micro SD port? But having USB video compatibility and an e-manual is useful and a nice extra touch is the voice memo feature that allows you to dictate little memory jogging notes to the car as you drive along. Enough with media connectivity. What else do you need to know about this cabin? Well, there are some hard plastics scattered around, but that's also the case with obvious rivals and build quality here feels pretty solid. It's pretty easy to get comfortable. The wheel, of course, adjusts both for reach and rake, and the driver's seat feels quite supportive, though it'll lack lumbar support unless you plump for this top spec ultimate trim level. There are thoughtful touches too. Pollen and microscopic sized particulate matter are trapped by the air filter. And on this top model, the air is treated by a cluster ionizer to purify it even further. Some models get a proper manual handbrake, which we'd prefer, but plusher variants like this car get an electronic one. The bonnet line is fairly low, so you get a good forward view, but there are some fairly large rear three-quarter blind spots, so it's just as well that all-round parking sensors are standard on most models. Storage around the interior is reasonably ample. You get a cubby at the bottom of the center stack where you'll probably want to put your phone because 12 volt and USB ports are nearby. It's a pity this area doesn't have a covered flap though, and that it can't be specified with the kind of wireless charging mats that many rivals now offer. As you'd expect, there's a deep lidded storage box between the seats with a narrow small cubby just in front and two cup holders just ahead of that. The illuminated glove box is a very decent size and has storage in its lid. And though the door bin compartment is initially very narrow, it widens towards the bulkhead so that two bottles can be accommodated. Sang Yong has also remembered little details like an overhead sunglasses compartment and ticket slots in the sun visors. Right, let's move to a part of the car that we think might really sell it to you. 
the rear cabin. Now, in a nutshell, you're simply getting more metal for your money here than you would with many of the class favourites. This Corando measuring in 56 millimetres longer than a Nissan Qashqai and 87 millimetres longer than a Seat Attica. You'd expect that to make a big difference when it comes to space on the back seat. It does. This is the only car in this class, premium brand models included, able to comfortably transport three fully sized adults on the back seat for any distance. Long journeys are helped by the fact that the seat backs recline by up to 32 and a half degrees, which will further aid headspace for really tall folk. Not that it's bad anyway. Rear legroom is also very plentiful, helped by scalloped seat backs and aided for the passenger in the middle of the rear seat by the fact that, unlike many of its rivals, this car has no bulky transmission tunnel. On top of that tunnel, Sang Yong provides a 12 volt socket, plus you get seat back pockets, reasonably sized door bins and coat hooks in the overhead grab handles. If there are only two of you, you'll be able to use this center armrest, which incorporates a couple of cup holders. It's this rear seat space that could well tempt buyers of Ssangyong's smaller Tivoli crossover model into this larger Corando. And the same applies when it comes to luggage room. Time to raise the tailgate, which is electrically powered on this top variant. Now here's a nice touch. It's the fashion at present to supply buyers with gesture controlled hatches, which you activate by waving your foot beneath the bumper. Have you ever tried to activate one of these and ended up wobbling about like an idiot in the supermarket car park, laden down with bags, looking like you're doing some sort of weird dance because your foot can't locate the under bumper sensor? We have. Sangyong's smart tailgate feature is a better solution. If you have the required smart key in your pocket and stand by the hatch for more than three seconds, it will open automatically. Other brands, take note. Once the tailgate has completed its arthritic perambulation upwards, a very decently sized 551 litre space is revealed. That's a floor to ceiling measurement and it's a very usable area. Providing you avoid entry level trim, you get this luggage board, basically an adjustable height boot floor, but a clever one split in two halves. This means that in this upper position, you can, if necessary, separate out your load and say prevent your eggs from mixing with the iron brew en route back from the supermarket. Unfortunately, entry level spec also requires you to do without this rear parcel shelf, but all other trim levels do, of course, have it. And thanks to these removable corner flaps next to the luggage board, there's the convenience of being able to store said tonneau cover beneath the boot floor, should that be in its upper position. Four tie down points are provided, two bag hooks, and there's also a 12 volt port here on the left and a switchable light here on the right. Those with longer items to carry aren't favoured with useful inclusions like a ski hatch, a 40-20-40 seat folding split or a fold flat front passenger seat. But to be fair, those kind of things are rare inclusions on SUVs in this segment. On the plus side, the adjustable backrest rake feature on this Corando's rear backrest means that you can sometimes put it into a more upright position, which could make all the difference when cramming in luggage on an airport run. If you need more room, then folding the 40% portion of the rear backrest increases luggage capacity to 842 litres. Or if you keep that upright and fold the 60% portion, the figure is 957 litres. With both parts of the seat back folded, there's an almost flat cargo area rated at 1,248 litres in size. So to the value proposition on offer here. Now, this Corando is offered in one five door, five seat body shape and prices from launch ranged in the 20 to 32,000 pound bracket common to Qashqai class mid-sized SUVs of this kind. Sangyong's developed a full battery powered version of this car you can ask your dealer about, but at launch the focus was on the two engines we're going to talk about here. Choose from either a 1.5 GDI turbo petrol with 163 PS mated to front wheel drive and offered with either manual or automatic transmission, or as in this case, a 1.6 diesel engine with 136 PS mated to four wheel drive and available solely with an auto gearbox. Let's try and simplify the range structure for you. There are basically three parts to the lineup. The first being that for the most affordable entry level ELX and Ventura spec models that come only with 1.5 litre petrol power and manual transmission. 
This is the sweet spot in the range for value, and most customers will want to find the £3,000 extra that Sangyong asks to get themselves into the slightly nicer Ventura version. Go beyond these variants and you're going to find yourself buying a Corando in the kind of 26 to £32,000 bracket that would get you a far better established contender in this segment. Though, as we'll see, those rivals are often nothing like as well equipped and usually not as capable either. The mid-level point in the range is occupied by the Pioneer spec diesel variants that Sangyong's aiming at the caravanning and towing community. You can either have a diesel auto two-wheel drive model or for £2,000 more, a diesel auto four-wheel drive variant. Finally, for private buyers in search of a bit of extra luxury, there's the top ultimate spec version we have today. With your ultimate spec, your options start at around £26,000 with a couple of two-wheel drive variants, petrol power and manual transmission, or for £2,000 more, more petrol power and an auto gearbox. Your final ultimate spec Corando option is the four-wheel drive diesel auto derivative we've chosen for this test. Though for this model, the price at launch was around £32,000, the kind of money that would get you an entry-level version of Sangyong's larger Rexton SUV. Mention of that larger Sangyong model reminds us to price position the Corando for you within the Korean brand's wider model lineup. If you're one of those buyers perhaps disappointed by the company's decision to downsize this fourth generation model's engine, then the bigger Rexton might suit you much better. It's priced in the 29 to 39,000 pound bracket and uses a 2.2 litre diesel with much more pulling power, 420 newton metres of torque. A selectable low range gearbox for really tough terrain and a choice of either five or seven seats. But it won't suit if you more greatly prioritise the relatively car like levels of handling, efficiency, and manoeuvrability that the Corando now offers. If those attributes appeal more and you want an SUV like product but don't need four wheel drive or any real off piste capability, then the product that slots in just below the Corando in the Sangyong lineup might be of interest. The Tivoli XLV. This two-wheel drive only model sells in the 20 to 22 and a half thousand pound bracket. If it is the Corando you've got your eye on, this Korean maker hopes it'll appeal even if you've got your eye on a more established contender in this segment. So how does the value proposition stack up? Well, it's certainly true that prices are now quite a lot higher than they were for earlier versions of the previous model and well above what you'd pay for really budget brand SUVs, models like Dacia's Duster and MG's ZS and GS. Sangyong wants to contend with the mainstream brands this time round and has priced this car in line with that aspiration. As a result, the most affordable Corando variant, the 1.5 litre petrol ELX manual two-wheel drive version seems at first glance to cost, well, much the same as comparable entry-level versions of rivals like Kia Sportage, Nissan's Qashqai and the Renault Kajar. And it's also within £2,000 of a base Hyundai Tucson. Sangyong, though, claims that doesn't tell the whole story, pointing out that you'd have to add around £1,000 or more onto the cost of a Sportage, a Kajar or a Tucson to match the standard specification of a base Corando ELX and well over £2,200 onto the cost of the Qashqai. It's a similar story with other competing models like the Seat Attica, the Skoda Karok, the Honda HRV, and the Suzuki SX4 S Cross. In other words, it pays to do your homework when shopping in this segment, and when you do, the Sangyong proposition still looks pretty strong. Of course, we've just picked out a few of the most popular mid-sized SUV volume brand contenders there. If you're spreading your net wider in search of compact mid-sized SUV alternatives to this car, make sure you're comparing apples with apples. There are plenty of slightly more diminutive super mini based B segment SUVs, Duke and Capture style models, selling at or around the price point required for lower spec Corandos. But those are smaller crossovers that Sangyong more directly targets with its very affordably priced little Tivoli, which costs from around £15,000, but can't now be had with four wheel drive. If we haven't yet mentioned the rival you had in mind for this Corando, it'll either be because it's one of those smaller segment models or because it's significantly more expensive than this car. 
Use that base Corando ELX petrol model as your benchmark and you'll find that you'll need around £3,000 or more to get yourself into entry-level versions of mid-sized SUVs like the Vauxhall Grandland X, the Citroen C5 Aircross and the Mini Countryman. And Corando prices are around £5,000 off the kind of money you'd have to pay for segment rivals like the Peugeot 3008, the Ford Cougar, the Mazda CX-5, the Subaru XV, and the Volkswagen Tiguan, though the difference would be greater than that if you were to equip any of those cars to the Ssangyong standard. Even top ultimate spec Corando models can look very reasonable value once you crunch the numbers. If you remember, we mentioned that a front-driven manual petrol Corando Ultimate will cost you from around £26,000. Well, once we looked at the obvious rivals mentioned earlier and equipped them to ultimate level, we came out with list prices ranging from £27 to £34,000. And even if you ignore that, you'll find that virtually all the rivals just mentioned can tow less and have smaller boots. Surprising, isn't it? Now, we've just talked a lot about enhanced specification giving this car an advantage over apparently similarly priced rivals. Well, let's drill down a little more into that and take a look at what the various trim levels really give you as standard. Starting with ELX spec, which, as we referenced earlier, can only be had with 1.5 litre petrol power, front wheel drive and a manual gearbox. Even at this base trim level in the range, you get 17-inch alloy wheels, a rear spoiler, headlamp levelling, tinted glass, LED rear lights, auto headlamps and wipers, keyless entry and alarm immobiliser and heated door mirrors with puddle lights. There are also projection headlamps that dip themselves at night, also incorporating LED daytime running lights and something called a headlight escort which sounds like something you might call to purchase from a card in a phone box, but actually turns out to be a useful feature that once you leave the car at night, keeps the headlamps on to guide you to your front door. Plus, there's plenty of standard camera-driven safety kit, as we'll explain when we cover that area in a few minutes. Inside, in an ELX spec Corando, there's air conditioning, a trip computer and cruise control. Neat standard touches include a cabin air quality control system and a heated lower front windscreen element to help you get the wipers going on a frosty day. Infotainment provision on the ELX model is limited to Bluetooth phone connectivity and a six-speaker RDS audio system. But that stereo setup does at last feature a DAB tuner. Now, rather surprisingly in this day and age, that had to be added to the previous model as a dealer fitted extra. Though at this level in the range, it still can't play MP3 files, which seems a bit old hat. Overall though, this is a very strong standard spec showing at this price point. Though we think it's a pity that base Corando spec no longer gives you a get you home spare tire, roof rails, front fog lights, or a cover for the luggage area. Sang Yong thinks that most buyers shopping at the affordable end of the range will, though, prefer to find the extra for a mid-level Ventura trimmed model, which covers off some of these emissions. The extra cash gets you a smarter look with larger diamond-cut 18-inch wheels, a chrome front grille, black and silver roof rails and LED front fog lights. You also gain all-round parking sensors and an electronic parking brake. The inside's predictably smarter too at Ventura level, thanks to additions like smarter upholstery, trimmed in cloth and faux leather, a leather gear knob and floor mats. Plus, you get a bit more technology. The brand's Blaze cockpit 10.25-inch configurable digital instrument cluster, a rear-view camera and an 8-inch center dash smart audio screen including smartphone mirroring via the Apple CarPlay and Android Auto systems and an audio setup that can play not only MP3 files but lots of other formats too. Practical additional touches include heated front seats, a cover for the cargo area and a luggage board that allows you to adjust the height of the boot floor. All well and good, but up till now, we've only been talking about trim levels you can have with the 1.5 litre petrol engine, manual transmission and front wheel drive. What if you want a diesel, an auto, or the security of 4x4 traction? Well, if that's the case, as mentioned earlier, the starting point for your perusal of the range will need to start with the two Pioneer models that Sangyong reckons will appeal to the towing community. With Pioneer trim, you don't get the Ventura version's 18-inch wheels and fancy Blaze cockpit digital instrument cluster. There are 17-inch rims and the base model's conventional dials instead. Plus, the front-driven Pioneer model makes do with a manual parking brake. Otherwise, though, Pioneer spec gives you pretty much what's fitted to a Ventura, and it's the only trim level in the range that deigns to give you a standard spare wheel. 
A lot of private family Corando buyers, though, are going to go straight to the top, ultimate level of trim we're trying here. It does, after all, include quite a few features that you might never have expected to be able to enjoy in an SUV at this kind of price point. Things like full leather upholstery, cool ventilated front seats and infinity mood lighting that bathes the cabin in your choice of 34 different shades at night. What else can you expect? Well, the front seats are eight-way electrically adjustable with four-way powered lumbar support. There's automatic dual-zone air conditioning. You get stainless steel scuff plates for the doors and there's a cluster ionizer to purify the cabin air. Plus, there's full LED multi-focus reflector headlights and a smart key system that will automatically shut the windows if they're open when you lock the car. In addition, Auto Ultimate variants get a powered tailgate and larger 19-inch diamond-cut alloy wheels too. Infotainment provision also takes another step up at this level, the larger 9-inch Centre Dash HD screen linking through to the Blaze Cockpit instrument cluster and incorporating full TomTom -tom navigation mapping. Even on this top variant, though, you don't get standard metallic paint, so unless you order your Corando in solid grand white, the only standard colour, you'll need to pay your dealer extra for one of the five available metallic shades. We've got cherry red here. Right, enough on standard luxury and technology spec across the Corando range. On to the safety provision provided across the lineup, which is one of the areas in which this fourth generation Corando model has progressed most from its more utilitarian predecessors, thanks to the addition of a range of camera driven features that couldn't be fitted to previous models. Impressively, too, this kit is fitted as standard to every variant, not just top spec trim. All versions get autonomous emergency braking, one of those setups that scans the road ahead as you drive in search of potential accident hazards. If one's detected, you'll be warned. If you don't respond or aren't able to, the brakes will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. To alleviate the need for this system as much as possible, Sangyong also fits a forward collision warning system that alerts you if you're travelling too close to another vehicle. You get plenty of other standard camera safety features too. There's lane departure warning to tell if you've drifted from your lane at highway speeds, with lane keeping assist to then subtly steer the car back to where it ought to be. Plus, all Corando models are fitted with traffic sign recognition that pictures road signs as you pass and displays them on the dash, and a driver attention alert system that monitors your driving reactions for drowsiness and if necessary, will suggest you stop for a restorative coffee. Also included is a front vehicle start alert system that in a traffic jam tells you when the vehicle in front's moved off and a high beam assist that automatically dips your headlights for you at night. That's in addition to the more familiar safety kit carried over from the previous model, which includes all the usual electronic assistance for stability and traction control, plus ABS with a brake assist feature for emergency stops that will be advertised to following motorists by emergency stop signalling. There's also active rollover protection, hill descent control to prevent the car going too quickly down slippery slopes, and hill start assist to stop you drifting backwards on uphill junctions. If all of this should fail to prevent you from having an accident, there's twin front, side and curtain airbags. These are linked into an emergency call system that will alert the emergency services with your exact GPS location should they go off in an accident. Plus, as you'd expect on a car of this price, there are Isofix child seat mounts in the two outer rear seats and a tyre pressure monitoring system. The Corando's fundamentally safe too, with a tougher body shell, 74% of which is now fabricated from high tensile strength steel, a much higher proportion than before. Plus, the front end is designed to protect pedestrians as much as possible in the event of an impact. It all explains why this car gained a five-star Euro NCAP safety rating. Obviously, the key reason for the switch to a smaller capacity diesel power plant in this car lies in Sangyong's drive for efficiency. Prior to the launch of this Mark IV Corando model, the Mark had been out of step with the industry trend for engine downsizing for too long, and the mediocre returns of the previous car's 2.2 litre diesel were becoming difficult for even brand loyalists to overlook. This was certainly a major stumbling block in the company's drive to widen the appeal of this car beyond caravanners and towers. 
So how does the freshly developed Euro 6D T-compliant 1.6 litre diesel unit we're trying here do? Well, it certainly shows that Sangyong is heading in the right direction. For this diesel also four-wheel drive variant, the WLTP rated combined cycle fuel figure is 41.5 mpg and the NEDC rated CO2 rating is 170 grams per kilometre. To give you some perspective on that, a similarly capable but much pricier mainstream rival like Volkswagen's Tiguan 2 litre TDI 150PS 4 motion DSG manages 52.3 mpg and 143 grams per kilometre. So Sanyong is moving towards respectability here, though there's still clearly engineering progress to be made. Obviously, you'll do a fair bit better with a diesel Corando if you opt for a two-wheel drive version, which, like the 4x4, is only offered with auto transmission. This variant records a WLTP-rated combined cycle fuel figure of 46.3 mpg and an NEDC-rated CO2 reading of 144 grams per kilometer. Obviously, an entry-level diesel auto version of a lighter, less capable front-driven rival, say a 1.5-litre DCI Nissan Qashqai, or a 1.6 litre TDI Seat Attica will do a lot better. But those cars simply aren't as tough as this one. Ultimately, it really comes down to what you want. We should give you the figures for the 1.5 litre GDI turbo petrol model too. For the manual model, these come out to add up to 40 mpg on the WLTP combined cycle, along with NEDC rated CO2 emissions of up to 154 grams per kilometre. For an auto, the respective figures are 37.7 mpg and 162 grams per kilometre. These returns are slightly further from the top class standard than is the case with the diesel, but the emissions readings are still significantly better than those you'd get from base petrol versions of, say, the Kia Sportage and the Hyundai Tucson. If running cost figures are everything in a car of this kind and you only cover relatively short distances, you might want to talk to your dealer about the full electric version of this car which should have an operating range far greater than that of, say, MG's ZS EV. Sangyong is talking somewhere in the region of 250 miles. What else? Well, the brand fits an auto-stop system to petrol and diesel two-wheel drive models that cuts the engine when you don't need it, stuck in traffic or waiting at the lights. Unfortunately, though, you can't, for some reason, have this on the four-wheel drive variant. If you're wondering about insurance, well, that's rated at Group 32D for the diesel variants. Residual values aren't yet quite up to the standards of other mainstream brands in this segment, but they're getting closer in line with Sangyong's improvements in product quality. Perhaps the best bit, though, is the peace of mind that comes as standard with this car, thanks to this Korean brand's impressively complete, industry-leading, seven-year or 150,000-mile warranty. As you'd expect, the Sangyong cover deals with all the major mechanical components, including wheel bearings, suspension joints and bushes, steering joints, shock absorbers, and even the audio system. Providing routine servicing requirements have been followed, of course. Wearable components such as bulbs and wiper blades are covered for one year or 12,000 miles, the same applicable to clutch, discs and brake friction materials that could have their life reduced by poor driving. What are your priorities in buying a capable family SUV? Well, magazine writers are usually swayed by handling dynamics and premium prestige, but the average customer tends to look first at more straightforward things. Exterior style, of course, that's what buying an SUV is all about, and value. A lot of volume brands have lost sight of that in their eagerness to capitalise on this profitable segment. You're also likely to want a spacious cabin, plenty of technology, a long warranty and a design tough enough to ensure that you're not embarrassed in the next snowy snap. These sound like sensible priorities to us and they obviously did to Sangyong because they were apparently the so-called cornerstones around which this fourth generation model was developed. As a result, this C300 series Corando model is sharp looking technologically adept and equipped with as much camera-driven safety technology as you'll find anywhere in this segment at this price point. 
In addition, it's actually class leading in terms of rear passenger space, towing capability, and the amount of equipment you get for the money. Plus, you get the industry's longest and most comprehensive warranty. Of course, there are still areas where this car could improve. We'd like to have seen a more affordable diesel engine variant, and elsewhere, you might read that this car could offer a slightly more supple quality of low-speed ride, and that the running cost efficiency could still be better. In principle, we wouldn't necessarily argue with either of those comments, but we'd also qualify them by pointing out that they reference comparisons with far less capable rivals. It's easy to make your product better in these kinds of areas when it doesn't need to be very good off-road and you're selling it for an overinflated price. Overall, there are signs that Sangyong, which literally means double dragon, is really starting to get into its stride as a car maker here. And while we're literalizing, we'll tell you that the name Corando is derived from the phrase career can do, which seems appropriate because a can do attitude is fast establishing this growing manufacturer in Western markets like ours. We saw signs of that with the two SUVs that flank this one in the company's lineup, the smaller Tivoli and the larger Rexton. But this car is the easiest Sangyong to recommend that we've tested yet and is a difficult option to ignore if you need a really capable car of this kind. You'll just have to get used to explaining to people what it is. And who knows, you might even end up suggesting that they try one.